<laughs> so welcome to the Happy Mindset Show, episode number 13. Today's episode is called Autonomous Learner. And today I'm joined by Sones Stevens. So Sones is a TED and TEDx speaker. She's also a coach to TED and TEDx speakers. Uh, mm-hmm. She's an associate professor of business presentation skills in Yokohama National University. She currently lives in Japan. She's from America originally. Um, she also practices as a, as a Zazen meditation, sorry, at her local temple in Japan. And uh, she's a bit of an omnivert. Um, she, she's an extrovert in, in the sense that she can coach people and present, but she's also like, she also likes her introspective moments too on the beach in Japan and, and, as an introvert. So an interesting fact actually about her first before we start is that she's also the official English voice of Hello Kitty. I thought I'd mention that too. That's that quote. Not every day you speak the hello kitty, so I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> so thanks for joining us today, uh, Sones. Dennis, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. And what a joy to be on, on your channel because I know how much you're really connecting with people who are trying to learn and really capture that essence. And it's, you know, there are so many different ways to learn and so many different ways to relate to information. So I'm really glad that you're creating a different way that people can connect with that information. Thanks, so. Yeah, so and oh, and you, you said you were like, you were surprised I'm an omnivert. I just wanted to tell you something about speakers because I do, um, you know, more than 80% of the TED, and, I, I've trained over 115 TED and TEDx speakers. And uh, based on most of the research from TED, most TED speakers are introverts. Some mm-hmm. of the best speakers in the world are introverts. And introvert just simply means that you, you gain your energy by spending time in solitude, reflection, contemplation, whereas extrovert, you gain your energy by being with other people. And if you're an omnivert, it means you kind of float between, you need copious mm-hmm. amounts of time by yourself and you know, going out and really connecting and engaging and brainstorming with other people and having that dialogue and then coming back. So for me in that case, I love spending copious amounts of time by myself at the beach. And at the same time, I get stimulated by being with other people. And then I need to retreat and back and forth. So which is why I'm totally comfortable being on stage in front of audiences, a thousand plus, and then coming back to solitude in Zazen meditation. Yeah, which is a traditional Japanese form of meditation. The temple is so close. When you come over, when you come stay with us, you'll come to the temple with us. Nice. So like, how did you figure out you worked that way? Was, it, was that something you always knew that you're, how to balance that introvert, extrovert? Or was it something over time you realized how you worked better? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I was on tour for 15 years and, you know, the storytelling audience of a thousand plus. And um, I was the only person out there who wasn't a performer in that sense. Like I didn't need to be on a stage. I was really good at it. I'm really great at, you know, I people would come up to me and say, you know, I was in the very back row of the audience, like a thousand. And I felt like you were speaking to me. I I could feel you. And I was, and I was literally speaking to that person in the very, very back row. And energetically, I wanted to be more present with them. But before walking on that stage, being in front of a thousand people, everyone else would be in the, in the green room, just and talking and being all like, you know, it was a big, big fest. And I would be like, all right, I need to be in my space. So I'd go off on my own. I would do my vocal warm-ups and, you know, I'd, I'd move my body, move my mind. And then when it was time for the team meeting, come back and then come back into my own space. And then I could be fully present with the audience. And after a weekend of that, and it was great and it was fun. And there was, you know, there was 40 people in our whole entire crew and, and uh, team. By the time we got back to... Tokyo from because we were in, on a nationwide tour for 15 years and um, I get back here and like the day after I'm like can't see anybody just can't like so I've actually already mentioned before that you try and connect with an audience of one that's your kind of philosophy or that's how you definitely started off and that you were saying so how did that help you to have that kind of I'm just looking to connect with one person first yeah well you know um it's, it's, it goes back to a lot of the, the Buddhist philosophies. And um, what happens is, you know, when we get out in front of an audience, we think, how do we entertain? How do we keep them all engaged? And what we really need to do is change that mindset. 
instead of having, how can I be with a thousand people? What is it that that audience needs? What is it that audience wants? They want the same thing that I want, right? You mm-hmm. walk out there and you think, the one thing that I want is, what is it? When you walk out on a stage, what do you want? To connect, to get your message across. Yeah. And even deeper than that, to impact if it goes, them. impact them. And even deeper, you know, we think about it, you know, we walk out and some people say they have fear of being on stage. Anybody mm. who says they don't get nervous, like we all get nervous. If you're not invested in your message, then you probably won't get nervous. But if you're invested in your message and you're invested in that story, mm. you're invested in getting that out there, everybody gets nervous. Even me, <laughs> after doing this for more than two decades, we all get a little bit nervous. Anybody who doesn't, they're either a liar or a narcissist. <laughs> so, but when we all want in that little bit of fear, fear is based in fear of being rejected. And that opposite of rejection is acceptance. Yeah, to be acceptance accepted. And be loved. We all want to be loved. So if we can get in that mindset that audience wants the same exact thing that we do. And one of the one of the practices that we do is the practice of compassion. And you just look out in that that one person who needs you right then and there. And there is one person. There is one person. It doesn't matter how many people are in that audience. It doesn't matter how many people are in that audience. It doesn't matter if the audience is big or small because it's not how many, it's who's listening. That one person, you think about that one person, you think, just like me, just like me, that person has felt pain. Just like me, that person wants to make a change. Mm -hmm. Just like me, that person wants to be loved. And if we can... If we can create that with that one person, it creates a neurosync in the audience and we can all connect that way together. You want to try that right now? Let's just try it. Just imagine one person that you can think of right now. Um, Maybe it's somebody that you saw today. Maybe it's a person, a barista at a coffee shop, or maybe it's a friend or family member or a coworker or me. (laughs) You can choose that too. All right. So imagine that person in your mind's eye. Imagine you don't have to like stare at that person because it's a little creepy. If I like look across the room at my teammate Mitsui and go like, Mitsui, you need compassion. You so need compassion. You need more. <laughs> it's, a little, it's kind of a little odd. Mm. Mitsui's over there smiling and laughing. She's, <laughs> she's thinking, oh, no, bro, I don't need compassion. You do, Sones. Okay. But, <laughs> so, all right. You have that person in your mind's eye? Mm. Okay. All right. So here you are in that moment. Imagine that person and repeat after me, just like me. Just like me. This person has felt pain. This person has felt pain. Just like me. Just like me. This person wants to make a change. This person wants to make a change. Just like me. Just like me. This person wants to be loved. This person wants to be loved. Excellent. Come on back. How do you feel? Yeah, I think it takes the focus off me and you connect on a more human level with the person in front of you. I think that's what yeah. I felt there. Hmm. Yeah. So what is it? Is speaking about you or is speaking about them? Well, it's, it's, kind of, hmm. it's, me getting my message across to help them get their message across. Is it? <laughs> is it? I don't know. <laughs> I'm confused. It is. It is. It, it is. Your yeah. focus is on them, so it takes the focus off you. As long yeah. as you're prepared. And this is another thing about introverts. Introverts are amazing. Uh, what I find is a lot of people, like one of my speakers right now is very gregarious, very extroverted. And he came to me and he said, um, Scott said, Sanes, I need some help with my speaking. And I thought, Scott speaks all the time all over. And he's super famous, big CEO of a big company and just like mega entrepreneur extraordinaire. And I'm like, why would Scott need me? And he said, he confided, he said, I went and I got a, got a flight. I was flown to another continent. I'm not going to give away too many of the details here. I was flown to another continent and uh, they paid me like five grand to come out and speak. And they paid for all my expenses. And um, I was giving the keynote and I got up there and I had spoke for 10 minutes 
And then I was waiting for everyone to do the Q&A and no one asked a single question. And the organizer was like, oh, what, what, but, uh, it, uh, oh, audience, everybody, he's trying to, you know, he's waiting for you to uh, ask questions, but nobody had questions to ask because he hadn't done the work beforehand. He, he relied on his gregarious, gregarious, gregariousness, <laughs> and my laughter, um, gregariousness and his extroverted side that's so great at communication and talking with people and anybody, no, no qualms, no hesitation to take him through the talk. And because it was that not having that full preparation, he wasn't ready for the full our mm-hmm. keynote, and he didn't know how to be in that moment with that moment with the audience. On the other hand, if you're an introvert, generally you tend to spend copious amounts of time preparing, getting everything down so that when you're at the point where you've nailed it, just like my TED speakers, you know, the best, the best TED speakers, they work on the talks for six months to a year. And then after that, rehearsing 200 times until it's second nature. It's as it's, it rolls off the tongue as easy as happy birthday to me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Are you? Right, right. Are you? Sorry. you know, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. We all know the song. So it mm. should be that simple and that should flow that easily off. And that's when you have the capacity to be fully present and compassionate with your audience. So it's no longer about you anymore. It's all about how can you focus on them? What can you do to be present with them and give them the compassion that they they they're looking for. Yeah. They're looking for. They're waiting for you, and it's. So it turns out it's not about us at all. That's it. I think the more we can see that, I know myself. The more I can see that, the less pressure I feel, and the more I'm free to just create and to do what I'm, I'm doing. So it mm-hmm. makes sense to me. Um, yeah, it's the same thing with learning a language because you're multilingual as well, right? Yeah, yeah, it's the same with learning a language. It's like when I get out of my own head and just look for a conversation and to get the meaning from the conversation without understanding in every single word, it just mm-hmm. flows more easily. And I'm just kind of, I can kind of see language as a means to communicate rather than to pass an exam. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's been my experience with it. Yeah, and so how can you be with that other person? How can you, you be in that moment? Um, I, I believe learning should be filled with creating opportunities for experiences. So the more that you're in that moment and having that exchange experience, like I'm, I'm learning Chinese. When I started learning Chinese when I, I was given a fan, I was given a dream job offer to move to China and um, long story there and for another day. However, mm-hmm. I decided not to go. I decided to stay in Japan. And um, so I started learning Chinese and I wasn't learning a lot from class because I was learning traditionally in the traditional Japanese style mm. from a Chinese teacher teaching in Japanese. So it was really, really interesting to hear Japanese with a Chinese accent. And then, you know, yeah, lots and lots of kanji. Like if I had a hard enough time with Japanese kanji anyways, adding the Chinese kanji on top of that was, was even harder. Uh, um, and I found I was learning more from playing games and doing apps. And then I'm learning more from my classmates next to me, even though I was the university professor just dropping in to, you know, take the classes just because I thought it would be fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I'm teaching presentation skills on the other building, but can I drop in after my class is done and take your Chinese class? Thanks. <laughs> and so I learned more from the other students. And what I realized having, uh, having, homestay, student, having homestay students come here um, get people from different countries. And recently I've been getting quite a few Chinese students. So now I've started, you know, a book, everything that I didn't learn in my Chinese class I'm doing here, but everything is situational, making that experience. First I was like, wow, you know, my, my Chinese sucks. I'd walk in and be like, ni hao, ni hao ma, my, how, hello, how are you? My name is Celeste Fujo, Sonas. And then I would say, you know, where are you from? Ni san Camila. And they're like, huh? Ni san Camila. And he's like, what? Ni San Camila, where are you from? He's no, he's like Ni San Camila. He said, No, no, I, I don't have a Sony handy camera. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh. I you know, totally felt like I should give up on my Chinese right here and now. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead, I'm making a pursuit of one one phrase conversation. Okay, I'm gonna start over from like I never tried to take a class ever before mm-hmm. and get away from the Japanese method of learning languages and move back into the situationally based ones. And so I take little 
videos of my homestay students like this, like uh, today, um, what did I learn today? So I would take this and well, you can't hear it at all, but I would take a video. Okay, so they pronounce what you're trying to learn. Is it is that the method? Mm. <laughs> and then regular speed. So I would get and he's absolutely brilliant. He's a really good teacher in that sense. And mm -hmm. his friend, when he first came in, it's two of them that came together. And the one is like he speaks English at an you know intermediate, advanced level, and the other one is a little bit lower. And um, he just kept saying every time, he's like, I don't speak English. I don't, my Japanese is terrible. And I'm like, because we speak both Chinese and Japanese, or English and Japanese here. And, um, and every day that I wake up, I ask, I need one phrase for today. And I usually end up getting two mm -hmm. or three. One phrase for the day. And, you know, I write it down. I have them write it down and, you know, have to take a video of it and then learn it. And I come back down the next day and I say, you know, I, I say my phrase. And then, so now the, the second one who was really low level, He's like, I'm going to beat you. <laughs> it's kind of like the attitude. He's yeah. like, I'm like, you know, I'm going to speak Chinese better than you speak English next year. And he's like, no. And so he's really trying really hard. It's really cute. Um, I'm not an English teacher. It just happens I have a homestay where people, you know, learn Japanese and English because they're just traveling through Japan. Oh, and you speak Japanese, don't you? Japanese. Yes. Do you find Japanese as a help to learn Chinese or is it completely different? I've been curious about before. Uh, I think some of the kanji are a little similar, but different mm -hmm. and the pronunciation. So for example, today, today they went to Kamakura to go see the big Buddha and Kamakura, the kanji are very similar, but a little bit different. And the pronunciation is nothing the same. And Japanese is a very flat language. Okay. And Chinese has a lot of intonation. Oh, okay. Like, like Italian. Italian. And it goes up and down. I think. Yeah, so it's got like ma, 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 ma. You've got a quite a quite a bit of a range. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So it's a you know, it, and we do the same thing. It's it's based on experience. You make opportunities for experiences. Yeah, it's what I I find when you turn language learning like, like what you've done there into more of a game and adventure. Um, mm -hmm. It becomes just more effortless, and you're not really getting bogged down in the, I should do this, should do that. And you can kind of see why you're learning the language in the first place. So that's pretty cool. So how it's was just, your... It's just having fun. I just have a lot of fun that's with it. it. Yeah, having yeah. fun and, and learning. Just, I suppose, learning. Finding that balance between actually learning from your mistakes and having fun in the same way. That was a question I wanted to ask you too. With your students, I've seen that it seems like they collaborate and they give feedback, but you want them to give honest feedback, not like this kind of... Mm. Push feedback. So how do, how do you find people find the balance between giving actual, truthful, honest feedback and being supportive as well at the same time? Well, it's really interesting uh, because I, I, I started all my communications research at the university here in Yokohama and all of the principles I use for autonomous learning, you know, model, prep and get social, I applied to all of my courses that I use because, you know, I used to coach TED speakers one-to-one -one, or I would coach the events or I'd coach uh, events. Like I just came back from Pakistan where I was coaching the National Digital Designers Conference. So it's mostly graphic designers and user experience people. So I would coach them in groups. And all of these same principles that I use for coaching um, for one-to-one, -one, when I had to take them into a group platform, for example, my TED events or my other events that I do outside of Japan, plus the online learning space, that how can I apply the same principles? Because if you're if you're an autonomous learner, and autonomous learning means that you take, not that you just take responsibility, but you have ownership. You know that you are you are the catalyst for learning. And so if we can create that in the same thing in a group online learning experience, which is why none of my courses are taught evergreen. Everything is a hybrid. It's all, okay, you get a video, you get PDFs and worksheets and bring it in. That's your, that's your independent learning. And then you can come back in together. And so the same thing I did the university system, which was I created kind of like mastermind teams. Mm -hmm but you have a small intimate circle and the circle of people gives each other and everybody's different within that circle. 
and they have different learning acquisition styles and they also have different speaking styles, which you know, because you are, which one? I think you are expand. I thought it was experience. I, experience, excuse me, experience. I think, Thank you. Yeah. I think I got it twice. Remember the first time it didn't work properly, but then the second time I think I got experience okay. again. Yeah, yeah. The tech on the app, I was having challenges with the algorithm. So I created a system where um, I've learned over the years, over 10,000 10, students going through my programs. So, okay, there are, if there are four different ways to learn and four different ways to experience information acquisition, and there are four different ways to connect and communicate that kind of language, how does that apply to speakers? And how can we, how can we give each other the most insightful feedback? It's either through engagement, how do we engage with the information, inspire, tell stories, infuse emotion, uh, educate through data, statistics, step-by-step -step information, and how to take people to the next level. It's the lecture area. And then through the, the ex, um, experiences, how do, you, how do you integrate by experiencing with an activity? And that's a lot of um, independent learners who don't want to be in a classroom are just like, let me figure this out myself. <laughs> they fall into that category, which is really interesting. Um, my darling is that as well. Hmm. And then expand who pe people who take off on their own, their own little uh, creation from that. And what else could they do with that information? So I would put people into these circles based on these categories. And I did the same thing in my online courses, because if we do, if we're all into in the same program together and we think the same way and we have the same businesses and we have the same ideas and we learn and process information the same way, what kind of feedback are we going to get? Mm -hmm. Be blind. How's that going to help? Yeah, we yeah. won't see our blind spots and stuff. Yeah. No, yeah, if we're in the same field, same industry, we think the same way and we're, we process information very similarly and it's, it's not going to connect uh, or we're not going to see the full picture. But we need, and I believe in, uh, there's a great movie called The Seven Samurai. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about yeah. that? What's the... Yeah. Seven Samurai, fantastic movie. It's actually the movie that influenced the American classic, um, The Magnificent Seven. And in this movie, there are seven rogue samurai, and this village is being attacked. And the villagers come to this, this ronin, this samurai who's going around by himself and say, can you help us? And he's like, if we don't have any money, he's like, mm, I'm not going to do this by myself. In the end, he ends up getting seven samurai who are so completely different characters. And they're all... They're all rogue, you know, some of them are alcoholics and like, you know, jokers. They're just so random, these people. It's, it, it goes beyond uh, the psychological idea of satire categories where there are five types of personality traits. And, you know, it's like yeah. there's seven people who are just so out there and you're like, there's no way they'll possibly work together. But instead, they ended up not saving the villages, but they taught the villagers how to save themselves. And in turn, they were saved as individuals. And so I incorporate that in my, my courses as well. How can we, how can we work together? Because as we work together to save the village, we in turn save ourselves. And so if we can have that kind of mindset, that's what creates an active learning process. Because while you're learning and applying the Feynman principle, which is the Feynman principle is if you can reteach what you've learned, then you have truly mastered it. And as you're doing that with your, your fellow samurai, <laughs> There are mm -hmm. seven of you in the circle, and they're all very different. Uh, then you can, you can really hone in what it is. You can see from different angles. There are things that you would catch that would be like, oh, oh, I didn't even notice that was missing because that's what we do for each other. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so I, I found it's really interesting to apply these. You know, in the university, it's all theoretical. And, you know, when they do research papers and publish in academic journals, it's a lot of theory. And... At the university for years, they're like, we, how do we get rid of Sinesse? She's like the black sheep of the university. We don't want her in here. You know, she's out there. She's the, she's the lady on TV, you know, and I am. So I have a TV show in Japan and communications and they, mm -hmm. they, they kind of regretted bringing on the TV personality to, to the university. Like, how do we get rid of her? Until they realized the techniques that I was applying, which they thought were so far out there, mm -hmm. were validated by practical research methods and uh, yeah. by science. And then now I'm their feature of research and I'm they're, they're, uh, they're creating, there's actually a, a person who's doing their doctoral thesis based on my autonomous and interactive learning styles. So oh. what seems really far out there, exactly what you're teaching Dennis is not 
it, people are catching on. Even institutions who are stuck in the mud are going to be like, yeah, this is, this is the way, Dennis. Yeah, eventually it'll, it'll change. Um, like I, I, I just know for myself that I can actually understand the theory better from context Yeah, because I don't actually look at the detail that much and I'm like, oh, I can see how that's how I went through something. or And then it sticks my mind better than I can retain it without having to go verbatim on it. So, uh, that's pretty cool. So how did you actually come to this autonomous teaching? So what was your kind of journey in hindsight for autonomous learning? Um, I didn't go to school mm-hmm. until I was 13. So um, my mom suffered from a mental illness. And as a result, we ended up homeless, living in cars, moving from truck stops to truck stop. And I didn't have a model of education in a traditional sense. Like maybe we'd, you know, we'd live somewhere for a few months at a time or maybe nine months. And then we'd go live in the car for, mm-hmm. you know, three to six months, depending on, you know, what the situation was at the time. And I loved going to the used, like Salvation Army and Goodwill. And my brother and I would dart back to the book room and I'd pick up books and I'd just stay in the back for hours reading and come out like, mom, buy me this math book. <laughs> What little girl is going to like, hey, can you buy me a used math book? <laughs> it's a little crazy that way. But in a sense, like, we all have curiosity and we're all, we're, we're born learners. And sometimes I feel looking around at other people, was it beaten out of them? Mm. Especially now that I'm here in a culture where I wrote education, which means you, you basically listen and write it down and regurgitate for test and then do it again and do it again and do it again. That's rote education. And I see that they're not having joy in learning. They're not saying, oh my goodness, would you please buy me this math book? Mm-hmm. They're saying, I have to study for a test. I have to learn this kind of information to get this score, to go to the right junior high school, to go to the right high school, to go to the right university, to get the right job, to marry the right woman. And to have a child do that whole entire process all over again. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so for me, I, I found at an early age self motivation. And when I eventually did move in with my grandmother in Florida, she totally saved us. And um, it was the first time in my life I went to school on a regular basis. I was 13 years old and ended up in junior high school and high school. And I ended up doing really well. I graduated top of my class. And the same thing, I graduated from university in three years, not four. And, you know, while working full time, Mm -hmm. because of the natural curiosity, the desire to learn rather than the institutionalized, you must, and therefore do. It must, it should come from, I want to. Therefore I do. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think? Well, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So, what, yeah, like I, so I often wonder too, is the curiosity and imagination beaten all of us through the education system? Cause my love of learning came after I came out the other side and I started learning Spanish and Italian for myself. And I came across like just hacks and stuff I was not aware of in university. I read a book called uh, fluent in three months by Benny Lewis. And yeah. Looking, and now I can see more clearly he was kind of emphasizing action, fun, and play, and that kind of thing. At the time, it was just like, I was looking at it, I was like, how can you speak a language from day one? And it just, I did not comprehend it, and that, but it set that kind of trail of curiosity. I was like, okay, there must be something to this. And I can remember being in Luxembourg for a while, and there was like kids speaking five or six languages, and they didn't think anything of it. So I thought, again, this is something weird. It's like, if that was me growing up, I would have been, if somebody spoke five languages, I would have been like, they're a genius or something. But I went yeah. over there and they didn't think nothing of it. So I was like, there's something to this. I don't understand what, but I want to find out. And I didn't, that's where learning starts for me. It's like my curiosity and my imagination. I think we all have that. And I think, yeah. I think sometimes we look at it as adults that we forget that we have imagination and it actually manifests in bad ways where we're creating dramas that aren't even there sometimes. And I'd rather that's harness that power to create stuff in the world. That's really interesting that you talked about that fun and that desire to learn when you did, because that's, it is taught the opposite way. You know, we look at, do you remember your first language class in high school? I think so. Yeah. It was just like learn this and learn. It was right. That was it. Like I remember in school, it was like write letters to imaginary people. I couldn't like, I suppose at the time there wasn't many multinational people in Ireland. I could never imagine myself speaking French to a French person. 
But once mm-hmm. I went to, once I started seeing I can actually communicate with somebody in French, that's when it really took off. It was like, I can see the benefit of this now. I can see why I'm learning. I uh, know. Yeah, I remember French class in high school and thinking, um, you know, repertoire. You know, it is just like repeat after me and Madame Stone. She was a very harsh teacher, and I was très bête. I was very stupid, and um, and I realized at that time I will never be able to learn a language. So when I went to university, I took all sorts of different classes, and I avoided the language department because I'm not good at languages. Mm-hmm. Is what I thought, and uh, and it wasn't until I started doing volunteer work in Rwanda, Africa, after the genocides. And uh, I started working with the orphans, and they speak mostly French. And I was like, oh, actually, I would start having conversations. And, you know, my friend at the time was like, I didn't know you spoke French. I'm like, I'm not speaking. Oh, my gosh, I'm speaking French. I, and, you know, he's like, that's a really complicated grammar structure as well. Like, I had no idea that it was just coming out though, because you desire to communicate. You desire to play. You desire to, you know, praise a you know, the beautiful Chapeau, you know, you're mm-hmm. like really excited about her hat and you want to have this conversation about it. And, and that's, the, that's the excitement. Whereas on the other hand, you know, the first thing, um, this is probably the reason why I didn't go into English teaching here in Japan <laughs> is because I, I disagreed philosophically with it. Mm-hmm. You, know, you open up a textbook and it says the first thing is, uh, here for useful expressions. Uh, I don't understand all. I don't understand because it's all written in, in the syllabary of katakana underneath. It would say English and then the Japanese and then the katakana with it as well. So the katakana is the pronunciation key in Japanese for mm-hmm. English. So instead of saying, I don't understand, it would say, I don't understand. And um, it's like, you know, and then under that it would say, I don't speak English well. Uh-huh. Uh, and it would just continue phrases like you know, every excuse in the book. I don't understand. I can't, under- I can't speak English well. Um, it's funny what you mentioned that I had a thought before I didn't, I didn't follow through in the end, but I was thinking, what if people started a language with only kind of positive stuff that went into the mind as in like, I can speak French and I, I, this is why I want to speak French and this kind of thing. Cause I think that focuses the mind. It sets an intention. It says, it sets a signal to yourself that I can do this. And this is why I want to do this in the first place. And when you're learning that in the actual language as well, I think it like for me, it's a, it's a way of rewiring the mind, learning another language, because you can start learning stuff in a different way than you learned as a child when you weren't conscious of the choices you made. So. And you have an opportunity to, to shift who you are in your second language. Yeah. So we don't have the emotion. There's research b- done by the University of, it'll come back to me, it's a university in Canada, and they did research on people who speak languages like as a primary language and a secondary language and the secondary language, we have less attachment to the words. So we don't have the, we don't have the charge positive or negative. So we have the opportunity at that point to decide who we show up in and who we show up as in that second language. So for example, like, so Dennis, um, I'm going to say a couple of phrases to you. You speak French. Yep. Okay, you speak um, English, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so if I were to say the phrase to you, ah, Dennis, je t'aime. Oui, merci beaucoup. Et je okay. t'aime aussi. <laughs> merci. Okay, Dennis, I love you. Yeah, I actually experienced this, as in I could see the distance between the words and I realized I could express myself differently in French because I didn't have the same feeling around certain things in English. Yeah, it's interesting because your face has turned a little flush, a little pink when I said it in English. When I said it in French, there wasn't that attachment yeah. to it. No, it's it very like, true. Yeah. It feels more personal in the native language than it does in the second language. And that gives you the opportunity to express yourself differently yeah. in, the native, in the second language. And then yeah. naturally, I think that will come back to the native language again in a little bit, again, bit by bit. Yeah. So it's a great opportunity. You get to you get to choose and decide who you show up as and what mm-hmm. elements are in there, and without having the emotional attachment. There was another woman who was actually French Canadian in the study, and uh, they asked. You know, she she'd grown up. Um, her mother abandoned her, and her mother spoke to her in French. And so when she had a baby, she she tried. She wanted to instill French in her baby, so she was trying to speak to her baby in French. She lost it. She just had a total breakdown. She went into therapy, 
And they realized it was the abandonment from the, the mother who spoke French. So she switched to speaking English to her baby mm. and she could totally connect with her baby at that point. It was the first time when she spoke English because she didn't have that same trauma attached mm-hmm. to the first language. Oh. So really sometimes if you experience a trauma, mm-hmm. it's better to speak in the second language. And also for decision-making because we see things in black and white in our second language as opposed to shades of gray. You look at a menu and you're like, hmm, what am I going to eat? Um, God, there are so many choices. I don't even know. You look at a menu in, in another language, like I, I can look at a menu in Japanese and like heaps of kanji all over it and just be like, boom, I know exactly what I want. My eye goes straight there. And I'm the first person at the table ready to order. And it's not because I just order the same thing every time. I can go to a new <laughs> restaurant and do this too. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's because we, we get into a mindset of yes, no, black, white, no shades of gray. It's like if you look at a menu in English, you're like, hmm. So, Dennis, do you want uh, the fish or the chicken or beef? What do you What do you feel like? Mm-hmm. And then think about it in French. What would be the same menu choices in French? Le poisson. Le bouffe. Le bouffe. Yeah. Le yep. poisson. Yeah. Le poisson. What, what would you like? Uh, yeah, it's true. It? Yeah, I don't, know why that, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because I don't want to think too much in my, in my foreign language. Or something. I just want to get it out. I don't know what the reason is there, but that, that makes sense. Yeah. I don't, uh, you distill your essence. What, what would you like for dinner now? And then go, you know, when you think about that in your second language, decisions are made like that. Hmm. Try maybe, it next time. Maybe habits of thought are, aren't carried over into the second language that you don't have these kind of habits of. Because I find sometimes I'll kind of know what I want, but I'll just have this habit of like kind of going beating around the bush sometimes in my native language. Maybe I don't have that. I didn't think too much about that, but maybe that's true. Try it. I, I use this technique all the time. If I have a second, if I have a decision to make and I'm deliberating, I switch into my second language. Mm. And, uh, um, so huh, I wonder what I want to ha- have to eat. Boom, commit it. I decide immediately. That's cool. I'm going to try that out. I never actually tried that, but it makes sense. Oh, it's a lot of fun. And you start expanding your vocabulary too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think the other main thing I wanted to touch on, like you, you've done a lot in your career. It's all varied and there's a lot of different things. So how did you go about following multiple disciplines? Like in hindsight, was it mm. the step-by-step or did you do a, lot, a few things at once? And how did, how did it happen? Oh, that's a really good question because it was kind of random how I ended up in Japan. I was on my way for my MBA. I was heading to Harvard. I was a shoe in for the program. This is before you had to cure cancer to get into Harvard. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, they said, you're a shoe in for the program. You just need to speak either Chinese, Japanese, or Russian. And I was like, oh, since I was a kid, I loved Godzilla. I used to watch Godzilla with my little boyfriend, Gregory. And, you know, like, I just, you know, like four years old or something, <laughs> but this kid named Gregory and he was watched Godzilla and I really liked it. So, uh, and I had a dream of being a ninja. So I moved to Japan and at that point, everything that I expected, I was going to get my MBA. I was going to be the CEO of Disney. You know, this is like, I knew where it was going. I had, mm-hmm. a, I had a plan and everyone in my life, uh, in my family, they were all creative people. They were all musicians and, you know, my mom was, my mom and, um, pretty much everybody's a singer. <laughs> so they're all musicians and I was not going to follow that path whatsoever. Me, stable, job, seeing people, one direction. That's all I got going on. So I came to Japan, studied Japanese for one year because I mean, I'm not stupid. How long is it going to take for me to learn a language? 20 years later, <laughs> I'm still here. Um, you know, and, and I ended up uh, realizing the way that I was learning was not, not the fast track. I would never do the process I did the first time. Like the first time I thought, okay, well, I'll make some money while I'm doing this. So I worked in an all English environment. I was doing communications trainings and, and I was taking Japanese lessons once a week and studying by myself. And, you know, I end up being the only person in Japanese class who is, you know, coming in with their homework done and ready to move on. And six months of class, I was like, my birthday is next week, December 23rd. <laughs> and they're like, Today, we'll learn numbers one through 10. I'm like, oh my God, why can't in six months of language learning? Why haven't we learned to count? And I have, you know, um, Mm -hmm. and so I just realized, all right, so 
my Japanese is not going the direction I wanted, but I loved being in Japan. I loved doing communications and I wanted to pursue Japanese language a little bit longer. And I didn't go back to Ireland. I'm staying here. And, uh, and at that was point, that a tough decision to make? It was it? a tough it was a tough decision because I had, you know, they were like, yeah, you're in. Um, you just go get a language and come back. Mm-hmm. Like, All right. And um, at the time, I just, I really loved who I was becoming here. And that part of myself, I would have never opened up. I would have never tapped into creativity. And after being in communications for so long, and then I ended up with a radio show and then a TV show and then, you know, a lot of different things that were opening up over here and then writing and researching and, you know, being on stage and then being on a nationwide tour for 15 years. And it was a hard thing to think I'm I'm ready to leave this, but there was never any one thing. I wasn't the type of person that would fit into Toyota motors. You know, they were going to hire this blonde girl to come in and do marketing and, you know, the things that I'd studied in university. So instead, we have to look at what are we interested in developing? What are we curious about? And start pursuing that. Because we look, in America, we have a resume, which is a list of the things you've done. Mm-hmm. Your, your work, it's a, it's a list. And I love how, I think in Europe, you call it a curriculum vitae. Yeah, same thing, CV. Uh, same CV, thing. it's not the same thing. Curriculum vitae, what does that mean? It's an accumulation Uh of life experiences. That's funny because we approach it in the same way. It's like a list of this is what I've done. Well, that's what that's been my impression. I could be completely wrong here, but I suppose. Well, the thing is, it's never in black and white. I did find with the with the job search, you Mm. can do something a bit different and stand out, and you'll find the right company for you. So it's not that black and white. Like on a societal level, I think it works that you put your experiences, your degree, your master's and stuff. And that's what counts for the majority of the time. But you can actually do things in a creative way and find the right company for you within that kind of structure. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of like the way it comes out. It's an accumulation of life experiences. And who are we without experiencing multiple things through life? So I've never, I've never worked full-time for a company like Toyota. I've always had a, a couple of things going on at a time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've loved, you know, I, when, I, when I did leave that, <laughs> the, the corporate communications uh, kind of style trainings, when I, when I left that, I went into, you know, to the university and doing research. And then I was on TV and radio and I had that. And then I was on tour on weekends. And you know, so I had all these things. I was working like seven days a week, but I loved every single minute of it because they were all completely different. And each of those experiences and my background in business, all of them came together and it didn't look like any of them matched. And yet they did. They all had a common thread. It all boiled around communications and storytelling and connecting with people. And we have to find by experiencing different things in life, what is that common thread that ties them together that makes you, you. You. Yeah. yeah. If we can figure that out, it's all that. It's, it's brilliant to keep pursuing and being curious. It doesn't mean you have to like, you know, quit your job every three months to experience something new. Mm-hmm. Although there was a guy who did that. I think he, um, he tried like a, a different job every week, 52 jobs in a year or something like that. Oh. And, um, but it's, it's about developing and every moment of that, you have to figure out who do I want to be with that gig? Mm-hmm. Like the university as well. When they came, they said, uh, they called up and they said, uh, one of the teachers of the university said they're looking for, um, they have to take a sick, like six semester off. They were extremely ill. Uh, can you come in and work at the university? And I said, oh, you know, we, we need an English teacher. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, thank you so much for thinking of me, but I, I can't teach English. I don't have that skill set. I believe there is a certain skill set to doing so. And uh, thank you so much for thinking of me for this position. But um, best of luck on your search. And they're like, do you know who we are? They're like an Ivy League school here. Like mm-hmm. everybody would want to work for them, even if it's part time. Like they were just like, do, do you even know? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much again for your opportunity. Um, best of luck in your search. I'm like, well, well, I'm like, you know, but I would be interested in teaching presentation skills. Mm. Uh, but Japanese don't need presentation skills. 
you know, they, they, and this was like 18 years ago. I'm like, they don't need presentation skills. I'm like, oh, well, then thank you so much for this opportunity. Best of luck in your research. So, will, will, will you teach it in English? I'm like, sure, I can teach it in English. This is going to be a piece of cake for me. <laughs> Way easier than teaching it in Japanese. And um, yeah, I'm like, okay, sure, great. They're like, great. Could you please come in for an interview? Um, oh, excuse me. We'd like you to come in on, on like whatever day. It was like a Thursday or something and do two classes on Thursdays on presentation skills. I said, oh, thank you so much, but I'm not available on Thursdays. I'm only available on Tuesdays. And they're like, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Blah, blah, blah. And they're like, who is this lady? Who does she think she is? I'm like, okay. I like, thank you so much. You're like, okay, 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 okay. All right. So, um, all right, we'll do it on the day that you want. We'll do it on, on Tuesdays. And, um, great. Can you come in for an interview? Uh, next week? I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm leaving for a trip for Vietnam and I'll be gone for three weeks. <laughs> and they're just like, you have the job. You have the job. <laughs> it's just like, they just thought, who is this lady? And I, and, you know, in that environment, you get to decide and choose, even if you think Dennis is walking into an office and he thinks every day, I don't know if this is what I want to be doing. You have the opportunity to say, I don't want to teach English. I want to do this instead and declaring that moment. Every moment you walk in and I look at all the other, the other professors and teachers in the departments and they're like, I'm like, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm teaching English. I'm like, oh, wow. How is that going? I'm like, I suck at that. I'm a terrible English teacher. <laughs> I don't know the difference between a subject verb and object or SVO or whatever that is. And, and, um, you know, and they're like, well, what do you teach? I'm like, I teach presentation skills. How did you get that? I asked. <laughs> like you just, you have to go in with the attitude of asking for what you want and creating that kind of position. Even if your job is in one specific way, how do you choose to show up in it as mm -hmm. that? Now I'm still underneath the global studies department, but you still can create within that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a daily choice. Who do I show up as today? When did you start realizing that for yourself? Was it something that occurred to you one day or was it just kind of looking back in hindsight or how did it, how did you get so clear on how, and it was you showing up rather than you trying to fit into the circumstance? I think I did try for a long time to try to fit in. Mm -hmm. uh, like there was a time where, you know, I have kind of light colored hair and blue eyes and there was a time where I, I wanted to fit into society so much here that I wanted to dye my hair black and, you know, I just mm -hmm. wanted to fit in because I think every weekend I was on tour and when I was on tour, I was on TV and, you know, I felt like I was always that outsider because it literally says it on my green card, outsider guy, Gene. <laughs> but uh, so there is a little element of wanting to fit in and be included. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, uh, I never did. Like I didn't have grow up with a traditional family. I didn't grow up going to a traditional school system. And I think there's a, there's a study that, uh, that, that they studied how children from, let's, let's just for nice terms, call it less than ideal families. Mm -hmm. They might come from a hardship, right? Children who come from families with hardship, they grow up understanding the locus, the internal locus of control is within. We are the masters and orchestrators of our own fate. And so we have to create that from here. And so there's that level of resilience. It's actually some really great research on resilience that the study was done mm -hmm. for. And it's quite fascinating. You know, yeah. we, we get to choose that and decide that. Ah, it's really, I, had a, I had a talk with my mom last summer about that too. You know, she's, uh, she's 86 years old mm -hmm. and she, she suffered with depression and, and I don't even want to go into the, the depths yeah. of what it was, but, uh, it was, it was, it was a really hard time for her. Um, and at some point she lost it and you can watch my TEDx talk from 2016 on, I saw that this morning, actually. It was a really good talk. I'll put it in the links as well, in the notes as well, for people to click into. Thank you. Yeah, and there was a moment in her life where she lost it. Like, she just felt completely unheard and unvalidated and unaccepted for who she was. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, this summer, you know, I spent four weeks living on a blow up air mattress in her studio apartment in a low income housing building in Connecticut, towered by treasures is what she would call them, which are all the things that she had my brothers schlep up from Maryland to Connecticut that she'd picked up at the Goodwill. Mm. Towers of them. Like she's got a major collection. And um, and I remember going through these things with her and working through some stuff. And I said, you know, mom, you know, there's this puzzle box here. This puzzle box had a, had a sticker, a post-it note on it. It said, Missing three pieces. I remembered seeing it last year. She still hadn't. She's like, I'm going to do something with that. I was going to give it to Audrey, the woman who lived across the hall, but she died. And see, my mom, she has this big fear of dying now because the woman across the hall, the sirens came for her. And she was ruminating in this, not sadness because Audrey had died so much as the fear of what if the sirens come for me next, knowing that death is a reality and she's 86 how much longer of a uh, of a time before the sirens come is what she's continuously thinking and she's ruminating in that space and so she's hanging on to these items with every last bit and she every morning she would wake up in this state of mind of just fear and anger and my brother was there with me my brother's room and he was helping me out and and we were together working through some stuff with her and getting her the medical treatments and all these things and um, decluttering things with her and working the process, not just like bag up her stuff and the right away. Like, you can't do that with somebody like this. You need to allow them permission to get rid of it and have them do it. Because if you do it for them, again, it brings back that mm-hmm. trauma. And uh, she was holding on with every last might that she had hanging on to the last string of life, the last string of life. And she'd wake up angry, holding that string of life and saying, who took mine? I'm fe- I need, I want. And I'm like, mom, this is how you want to show up in the world every day. And she'd yell at my brother. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't berate my brother. If we're going to invite him here, you have to treat him with love and kindness because you can't do that. You can't continue that cycle. I won't permit it. Is that how you want to show up? Do you want to continue that cycle that happened to you? She said, no. Well, who do you want to show up as today? Who do you choose to be? You get to choose that person on a daily basis. And she says, I choose to be the woman I was 40 years ago. I was a star. I was charismatic. I was the son. Whoa, 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 mom. She's, She's gone. Who do you choose to be today? And she stopped and she thought, And I gave her some time. I choose kindness. Okay. Then today, let's choose kindness. And she was. And every day we woke up for the continuing three weeks that I was there, sleeping on an air mattress. Mm -hmm. Who do you choose to be today? I choose to be grateful. Okay. Who do you choose to be today? I choose to be loving. Who do you choose to be? I choose to be laughing. Okay. And every day she grew lighter. Every day Mm -hmm. she grew uh, more kind and she laughed. And I never heard her say thank you. She never says thank you. And she started saying thank you to both me and my brother and our other brothers and the people down the hall. And when it came back for that puzzle box, I said, so how about this puzzle? Missing three pieces, like the three pieces that she felt she was missing Mm -hmm. all this time. And she was finally able to let it go and choosing to weave a new tapestry of life. That's powerful stuff. Yeah. I like the weaving new tapestry of life because you do have that power at each moment to weave your own tapestry. So it's, uh, and it's never too late to change for me. That kind of shows there as well. You can just, Show up differently whenever you want. Um, so mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Thank you for asking. Um, yeah, this, is, this has been great. Uh, so this has been a lot of stuff covered here. I think a lot of uh, people listening in will see the potential 
of what they can do in the world from just listening to you. Um, I guess my final question is, is what your what your favorite book is, if you have a favorite book. Oh my, my favorite book. The War of Art. War of Art. Stephen What's Pressfield. That? What's that about? Um, it's about how we show up with our creativity and how uh, we sometimes we perceive these creative blocks. And instead of having them stop us, how do we work with them or around them and acknowledge who we are as creative people? It's one of my favorite books. I'm constantly re- referencing it. Um, it's constantly referencing it. Now I'm looking on my bookshelf. Where'd it go? I moved everything on my bookshelf. Like I had to take all the books off <laughs> because mm-hmm. I had to release another bookshelf. But it's one of the most powerful books on creativity. Stephen Pressfield, The War of Art. Okay, let's have a look yeah. at that. It's a nice right. title too, actually. Yeah, because usually it's the art of war, but in this case, yeah, I've read the art of war right, by Lao Tzu. Um, yeah, it sounds interesting. The war of art. Yeah. yeah, cool. Thank you. Perfect. So thanks a lot for taking the time out to talk to us today, Sonis. Oh, and thank, uh, you. thank you, Dennis, and thank you so much. And what I really appreciate you about you, especially because you're taking my um, speaker branding or build your speaker bio and media sh- sheet. <laughs> yeah, this month, yeah. That's, that's been really helpful. Like, at the moment, yeah. I'm in transition to going to speaking. I've got, I've got my first talk at the end of the month. So you've been yes. a massive help for me to get clear on what my message is and how I can help people with the learning process. Yeah. I'm so proud of how you show up, Dennis. And when you first joined Get Booked to Speak in a Week, you know, you're like, oh, well, it's out, it's in. Yeah. and who's going to want to listen to me? And I love how you show up every time and every call and every, every day with all the materials because it's hybrid. It's, you know, it's just, you know, you're not just getting videos and PDFs. You're showing up to the calls. You're being active and participating. You're like, how can I get to the next level? How can I learn more about this? How can I and you get so curious and then you take action on it. And so you're creating these opportunities. And that's why I resonate so much with you as a continuous learner. Mm -hmm. And I'm super, super psyched about your talk this month. I'm super psyched. I am like over the moon for you. And I just, I really appreciate and value how you show up. I think you're amazing. (laughs) <laughs> Thank, <laughs> thanks thanks <Dennis>. Jonas <laughs> <laughs> <Je t'aime. laughs> uh, oui, <t'aime> <laughs> so cool. thanks a lot Sonis, and um, until next time have fun and enjoy the process <laughs>